Awesome. Happy days. Lovely. Ronald, Tim, thanks ever so much for being on the show. It's good to finally chat, mate. How are you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing really, really well. Thanks, mate. Good. Awesome to meet you. Yeah, and that's good. So we were speaking about a week ago. I think we just came across each other on Facebook, and I think you've got a really interesting story. So tell us all about it, mate. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'll go back to the beginning. So <laughs> up until I was about seven, everything was cool. And uh, I was a happy kid, really happy be really confident really come from a big family lived on a big council estate loads of friends everything were good and then I went to school <laughs> and um, school didn't work out quite so well for me no. and um, because I always wanted to know why right so I was a big question asker like we all are yeah. and um, I soon found out they weren't really interested in telling me why they were just interested in telling me what to do but I'm awkward like that so I kept asking yeah. And that kind of went okay for a couple of years. But then I got a teacher who was a bully and he made it quite plain to me that this wasn't acceptable, but I carried on anyway. And then one day I got blamed for something I didn't do at school and he come grabbed me physically and dragged me out of the classroom. I was seven years old, yeah. picked me up, carried me out, slammed me on the floor and told me to sit there till the next bad kid came out. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not taking this. So I went home and told my mom and dad, but because I'd been playing up at school, they didn't believe me and they called me a liar. And then everybody in my world called me a liar. So everybody just went against me. And when you're seven and your parents turn the back on you and everybody in your world turns the back on you, you kind of don't know what to do. So I did the only available thing, which was went mute for three weeks and refused to talk to anybody. And when I came out the other side of that, my world was very dark and I had anxiety, depression, PTSD, I was having nightmares, waking mares. I didn't dare go to sleep because it was so terrifying when I shut my eyes. The, I, was, I was just a mess. And um, I kind of carried on throughout my childhood as a bit of a mess then. And um, kind of getting the hang of things by the time I was a teenager. And then me and my mates were walking uptown, got chased by a gang of lads, and it kicked my PTSD back off. And I sort of spiraled into uh, alcohol <laughs> as my kind of way of escaping and way of numbing it down the pain, which then transitioned into drugs and smoking weed. And But in that weird world, I found myself because I ended up being a DJ of all things. <laughs> and, um, and I did really, really well. So all of a sudden, I saw what I could do because I'd never seen it. Yeah. And I suddenly excelled. I used to get called the king of clubs, you know, and and that's how it felt. I was the king of clubs, you know, and all of a sudden I got this uh, at the weekend, I'd play to a few thousand people. Yeah. And then Monday morning, I couldn't talk to my own team of four, four, that's three, four, <laughs> four. I'm not good at finger counting. So. That's okay. my, uh, my own team of four at work, I couldn't talk to them. And I worked with them all day long. But if I had to then speak in front of them, I, my social anxiety was so bad. I couldn't even talk to my friends, you know, sometimes. Yeah. So this like made life really hard, as you can imagine. But then I had this sort of dichotomy between Tim Tom, which was my DJ name, and Tim, which was me. And there was such a massive gap. So I got to the point with the end of my clubbing career where I knew, well, my dad got sick, to be honest, and I ended up making a choice. Do I look after my dad or do I carry on? And it saved my life, I think, because it yeah. pulled me out of that sort of drug world. And then... I turned my university into wheels and just decided, right, I'm going to get Tim, Tom and Tim at the same level without the drugs. Nice. So, so that's what I've been doing for the last 18 years. Um, and I'm pretty much there now. And then during that journey, I found out that the thing I love the most in the whole world is assisting other people out of the darkness into the light. Mm. And I love nothing more, you know? So I've spent the last 15 years building a system and then that was kind of going okay until five years ago and I met an amazing man called Tom Stone uh, who pioneered a system called human software engineering, which is about using the feeling level system of the client you're working with to go inside and discover what's going on within themselves okay. and then te teaching them how to safely release any emotional kind of trauma or anything that's going on in there. Um, and then I kind of mentored with him for a year and then went out on my own and soon discovered that I didn't like 90% of it. So I dropped that and 
kind of evolved my own kind of way of doing it, uh, which was much more feeling based, much more the person's truth based, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, so there's no, I'm not projecting anything onto their experience whatsoever. It's all their experience and, uh, and their truth. And, and, and so I start off with the emotional stuff, then go into the blueprint, the kind of meanings, beliefs, stories they're running underneath, and then eventually get them in touch with back in touch with themselves and build that relationship with themselves. So wow. it's been quite a journey, but I'm grateful for it all because it means I get to show up as who I am now, which is awesome. And I, I love what I do. I love working with people as I'm sure you do too. <laughs> and um, so I'm actually grateful for that quite tricky start in a way, um, which has been a big shift for me in the last few years because I've suddenly seen it from a different angle yeah. and seen that as if that had to happen, then this wouldn't be happening. And who knows what it would be like without that, but I like what it is now. So I get to be grateful for the first bit as well. So that, that's it, isn't it? And that, wow. What, <laughs> what an intro, Tim. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so there is something in that though, isn't there? And I, I think, I don't know who said, it. I don't know if it was maybe Alan Watts or maybe Steve Jobs who talked about that. It's only when you get to the certain place, that you yeah. can connect the dots and that you needed to go through that crap, if you like. For all exactly. Beforehand, because then you wouldn't be any good at what you're doing now. No, no. Because <laughs> how could you lead somebody anywhere where you don't know? Exactly. exactly. I look at I look at my job being like a tour guide, mm. literally, yeah. <laughs> because I'm just taking them through an experience that I know the pathway through. Yeah. But they have their version of it, and I don't know that, you know. And it's but I do know how to keep them safe while they're going through their version of it, and. I might point out certain destinations on the way, you know, there might be like, Oh, if you look up on the right, there's a nice bridge there and you know, or whatever, yeah. you know, I'll take them through little things. If I can see it from the outside and just suggest, is that, uh, is that anything to do with this? Blah, 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 blah. But it's largely them going through it and me just being the tour guide. And I love having those journeys with people. It's just awesome. It's mm. um, just to see somebody light up in front of you yeah. is the most beautiful thing in the world right it's yeah. nothing better well and the fact that you got to obviously not take responsibility but at least play your part within that for them yeah exactly um, it was lovely and and i, I know and i'm sure, sure you've had it as well and the way you've just described that being the tour guide is, is a great metaphor actually i like that <laughs> um the, the moment that they come through the door the moment they sit down in front of you They've mm. done essentially 70% of the work there, maybe closer yeah. to 80. The yeah, moment yeah. someone's made that decision at least to say, okay, I know what I want. I just need the tour guide now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I always tell them, when you signed up, you started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. When, even, if, even if you did nothing ever before, you started then. Because they'll say to me, on like, I always have a discovery chat with people to see if we're aligned mm. and see if, um, if I see us being a good team because I look at it as, as being a team to go through it. Of course. And um, they always say at the end of that, oh, God, I feel better already. And it's like, yeah, because you've already started moving. <laughs> you know, you've, you've taken some action. Maybe you've never taken action before. You know, because we all get stuck at times, right? And it's like just that stepping forward, even if it doesn't resolve anything, but the fact you stepped forward and the fact you put yourself, made yourself important enough to go and talk to somebody or to go and do some work with somebody is often a big step for some people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's normally the scariest as well, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Isn't it? Because you're putting yourself in someone's hands and you, you sometimes you don't know them. You don't know anything about them. Yeah. You just, somebody's recommended them or you've seen something that pressed the button, you know, because I make quite a lot of videos. So often I'll get people contact me and say, what you said in that video really resonates. And then we'll start a chat like that, you know, um, but they don't really know me. But I think, I think when you're open and when you you feel something or awareness around somebody. If you just trust that, I think it's usually right. I think the trouble comes when people use this, use their head to mm. make the decisions, you know, <laughs> that tends to be, that tends to be when it doesn't often come from their truth, especially if they've got a lot of stuff running in there, yeah. you know, whereas I find working with people on a feeling level, that stuff never usually lies. It's, it's usually pretty accurate. Yeah. Well, I mean, so some, something that I normally say to people is the, the difference between knowing something logically and emotionally <laughs> is, is death, actually. You know, you can pick up, <laughs> pick up a packet of cigarettes and you can read perfectly clear, this is going to hurt me and it's going to harm my kids if I smoke around them. 
Yeah. And it doesn't mean that people are suicidal and don't care about their kids. It just means that they don't have it on that feeling level yet. Yes. So, so I, I completely agree with that, that actually trying to, I mean, as it's all, as the issue or the, the thing that they want to change is feeling based, using yes. a strategy that determines logic is, is nonsensical. <sighs> isn't it? I know. I know. And it, it makes you realize why speaking therapies often don't have a good effect on people. Mm. I know it's good to speak. It's better than keeping it in and not expressing it at all. Mm. But when it comes to resolving it, it I, I don't find it. It's good for bringing stuff up, but then you need the tools to go and work on the feeling level of that, as you know. Mm. You know, um, but that and that's where the magic comes from. When you take that feeling level stuff out, all the logical stuff fixes itself. You know, it's the the when I do talks, the you know, analogy I use is that once I had a I used to run a lot and I had a athlete's foot, okay. and I went I went to the doctors and he gave me some powder and it did nothing, and then he gave me some cream and it did nothing, so he sent me to a foot specialist and he gave me some. I think he was some tablets or something and it got a little bit better and kind of worked itself out. But then a few years ago I had a, I had a gut problem and I went on a cleanse to clear my gut out. And as soon as I cleared my gut out, my athlete's foot disappeared. Mm. And it's like, I use that as an analogy because we're so busy trying to work on our brain a lot of the time, but the brain's just the expression of it. Sometimes the actual, the, the issue, if you want to call it that is in the feeling level, you Mm. know, and it's, very much like my gut you know you clear the feeling level up and the brain just automatically flows you know all the noise goes away the voices go away the kind of overwhelm goes away because it's no longer being triggered by the feelings yeah you know and that's that's why we work we always start i'm not saying mindset doesn't have its place i love mindset myself as well but i always start with the feeling level because otherwise if the person's probably fighting against themselves or the sort of feelings levels. I heard a really good example of it, actually. Uh, are you into Joe Dispenza? Well, yeah, yeah, very much so. You are the placebo, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I've, so. I've, I've, I've got all these books and um, I've had a break from him for a while. And then yesterday I was watching London Real and saw his interview with Joe and I was like, oh, I've listened to one of his books when I'm out on my bike. So I'll put um, Breaking the Habit of Being You or whatever it is, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, and he was talking about coherence and I'd never heard it talked about like this like as in a laser so yeah. a la- the reason a laser's light is so powerful is because it's coherent so the peaks of all the waveforms line up yeah so it's so it's really powerful mm. and and then he likens that and he was saying like if your mind and your feeling system are coherent you know they're going at the same they're going in the same direction basically yeah so then you pull in one direction but if they're going the opposite directions which people's often are yeah you know, consciously they want all the good stuff in life. Consciously they don't want to pick that cigarette out of the packet, you know, but something on their feeling level <laughs> overrides all that and says, do it, do it, go on, you do it. So we end up with that angel and devil kind yeah. of thing going on, don't we? Yeah. And uh, I, I smoked for years and I was, I had that all day long. I'd be like, yeah, healthy, 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 healthy. Yeah. Get to seven o'clock and I'd walk around the corner and buy a packet of fags and a four pack. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, why am I doing this? But I didn't understand this stuff back then, you know. And it's, um, but when them unconscious patterns are running, you know, we're along for the ride a lot of the time, aren't we? So yeah, and and it's really really interesting because, and what I love, and and I think there's so many similarities in what we do, and I think the slight differences, is, it, it, it may be in the expression of how it's done because I know, and I'm, it, t- it totally makes sense as well that when you're talking about someone moving from one place to another mm. actually the way that that person needs to hear it is through is through a feeling level yes um, the way i normally work and obviously i don't necessarily express it this way to people because like we said that's we're using logic to change something <laughs> a feeling level is what's happening with their biochemistry so you just use an example of yeah i've got this feeling in my gut that tells me this and actually my mind is, is saying this and and more and more stuff is coming out nowadays isn't it about gut health but actually the moment that you've got gut inflammation yeah. well, that alone can trigger depression. And yeah. so it doesn't matter how, you know, you can write, you know, your gratitude lists and your journals. each. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if your gut's inflamed and suddenly you've got this poisoned microbiome, if you like, it doesn't matter how nice your thoughts are. It doesn't matter how much, you know, Tinkerbell's been <laughs> putting the fairy dust on you. Yeah. You're not going to be budging. Um, so, so it's really, really interesting that you, 
I guess the analogy and the metaphors that you're using, even though I guess we're describing the exact same thing, aren't we? Really, we are. And what's really interesting is, um, and the reason that when I saw what you do and you put biochemical, the reason that interested me so much is because I'm I'm just going through a parasite cleanse, yeah. and um, I went to Columbia in the summer and picked a parasite up. And uh, it's brought with it a bacterial infection and some other goodies. And um, so I've, st- I've started working with somebody on it. And uh, the parasite bit of it's just about finished now. And then I had a colonic and an, uh, and an enema at the weekend. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was like somebody, somebody just lifted some darkness off me in about an hour. <laughs> I suddenly felt like a different person, you know, mm-hmm. and... Because I am so um, conscious and so positive and don't kind of get sucked into feeling stuff, I go and resolve it. I thought I was all right. I didn't realize I was actually, and the guy who did it, when he got my results back, he goes, I'm surprised you're not more sort of down than what you are. You seem very upbeat. And I was like, yeah, I know because of what I do, you know, it's <laughs> uh, my emotion. Yeah, emotionally, I'm quite a lot free freer than most people are because i've cleared all of that stuff so i've probably got a bit more bandwidth to deal with this mm. you know and uh, I, um the day after i felt a little bit sick because he did a really deep cleanse inside me okay. and then the next day i woke up and i was like whoa <laughs> you know, when you wake up to a sunny day when it's been gray skies it was like literally like that so i couldn't agree more it's mm. like all of it intertwines. I mean, we know the mind body, there's no difference between the two, but they both have to be healthy. You know, if either one of them's not on par, then it's going to make the other affect the others, you know? Um, and that's been like, yeah, that's been, I mean, I'm interested to hear more about what you do because, um, I'm totally into all the kind of biochemical side of it as well. You know, um, not that I do that myself, but I'm very aware from my own sort of experience. Um, that it does affect you a lot yeah i mean definitely i mean the idea of clearing emotions I, I i'm sure there's definitely a biochemical component i'm that's why i'm curious that again it would be nice to just yeah, yeah. um to rub off each other when it comes to what we're doing because i think there's definitely some some things that could help each other such as you know do you talk to your clients about diet but we can jump into that in, in a bit so the theory that i normally lead with with people is that first of all for us to understand why we might be feeling the way that we're feeling let's mm. just get it clear that we'll our neurons in our brain, everything from our gut health, every part of our physiology, it's there because we're wired perfectly for a society that existed 50,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've had the same bodies for 200,000 years. So actually, if you take those cavemen and put them in an era um, in the 21st century where we don't have to move as much, everything is disturbing our sleep cycle. Everything is ruining our gut. It's easier to be alone more than ever before. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly we're realizing why people are getting sick and people's mental health. Yeah. Well, we'll ha- you know, we've got a few evolutionary mismatches that we need to deal with. Um, so I'll normally go through a few things first because actually I guess the first step for me is, well, hang on a second, before we start to use any, I don't know, hypnosis, before we start to go through any therapy, what's your sleep pattern like? Because if you've come in today and you've slept two hours, well, then half of what I'm going to say isn't going to go in. Or mm. when was the last time that you moved your body? Because actually, if you've been sedentary for three days, well, then we already know that neural pathways in your brain have started to erode. And so it's quite difficult for us to feel rebooted in any way. So I use... I get them to take, I guess, specific actions in regards to diet or movement or Mm. sleep or actually just having a conversation with someone. And, you know, connection is a huge thing that we're lacking nowadays. Massively, massively. Even though you and I could technically, when we thought we were when we first started, we thought we were in other parts of the world. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's <you know>. so funny. <laughs> so that's how we, um, but right now, you, you could be, you know, on the other side of the globe right now, and we could just be having the exact same conversation, having the yeah. exact same connection. So we're living in a time where we get to do that. But we've stopped. And actually, this would be even better if we were in person. We'd have more of that biochemical flow of oxytocin being released in our bodies. And um, so... I use that, I guess, as a big metaphor to probably say the same thing that you yeah. do, which is, well, you're not broken in the first place. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm a that's tour my guide. biggest message. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's the idea of, I'm a tour guide to help you get you to where you want to be, but let's understand that where you are right now isn't yeah. 
it isn't that you're broken in the first place. I can't fix you. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So, so I, I totally, I'm totally on board with that, with that message for people. And the moment that I think a lot of people understand, wait, okay, so if anyone, a little bit like when the, the guy came in and told you about your gut health, hang on a second, so, so most, those people should be feeling pretty crap right now. Um, mm. And if people maybe didn't have the emotional intelligence, the self-awareness that you had, quite rightfully so, you take that gut health and pop it in any other person, mm. you know, their, their mood's going to change. So, so I work on a system where I try to get people biochemically sober, where essentially, you know, mm. even though we've got caveman bodies, you and I don't need to go <laughs> spearing world yeah. war. But there are some, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the common reaction I get when I say, what do you mean? <laughs> um, but essentially we still need to live within those evolutionary parameters that yeah, sure. our genes have, have essentially been evolved for and you, you know exactly what it's like with emotions that actually when we're having a feeling of anxiety or depression or even just a, a mild something's not right mm. our, our body is just trying to send us a message exactly um, and and we've become incredible at ignoring it and you <laughs> suffered greatly for it. Massive. Um, yeah. so, so it seems that, I mean, I, I talk about this very briefly in, in, a, in a principle um, that I refer to as just simply as connect. But I guess, I guess one of the principles that you, I, I have no doubt you're teaching with people is to actually just start listening <laughs> to, to, to yeah. the emotions that are coming up, right? Well, some, somebody asked me the other day in a sentence, what do you do? And mm -hmm. I said, I reconnect people to their heart. Yeah. to the feeling system yeah because we're so numbed out you know what i mean we're so numbed out and we've been we've been programmed to look outside for all the answers when they're all inside you know and it's just getting people to look i remember wayne dyer said uh, on one of his talks i heard this thing and it was the most beautiful thing i've ever heard he said the, there was only one thing god got wrong he put our eyes on the wrong way around <laughs> <laughs> We're always looking outside for the answers yeah and um well, i really like that because yeah. it's like it's, it's like so so spot on but i i know that's not an accident we've been trained to do it you know mm. we've been trained to do it by uh, whatever you want to call it modern medicine but modern sort of medical practices and whatever to go and ask somebody you know but i, I love an example right my old business partner is um an arabic guy he was brought up in jordan mm. and when he was a little kid he used to, uh, for about six months, he used to keep licking the walls of all the buildings. So he, eventually his dad took him, to the, um, took him to the doctors and the doctor said, and all their buildings are whitewashed yeah. and they've got saltpeter in the whitewash, right? Yeah. So he tested him and he was deficient of it, <laughs> right? But his five, six year old self yeah. knew that, it knew that was what he needed. And he might, I don't know how he originally licked it, but at some point he licked it for some reason. And his body instinctively knew that. And then he tells a story of one of his dogs. One of his dogs every month goes to the corner of the same park and there's this weird grass. It sticks that grass down its throat and throws up. Right. So, so it's got like a cleansing routine it does yeah. once a month. Because obviously it knows it needs that. Yeah. You know, and it's like, but we've had that kind of bread out of us, haven't we? We, mm. we just you know, anything's wrong, we go and, you know, we're straight to the doctor and then the doctor's armed with one tool, right? And I always say to people, if you've got one tool, so if you've just got a hammer, everything mm. looks like a nail, <laughs> you know? So yeah. no disrespect to doctors, but the only thing they're armed with are half the time for like the kind of stuff we help people with is antidepressants. Yeah. So that's all they give, give out. They don't, there's no kind of going inside what's actually going on. What's the root cause of this thing, you know? Yeah. And you're right. It's we've been we forgot how to feel, yeah. you know, because all of that I I call the feelings the sat nav to your soul, the sat nav to your truth. Mm. They're just the things that will take you to the point in you wherever you're holding that, whatever you want to call it, energy or emotion or whatever you want to call it, you know. And that's what I do with people. I get them to use to uh, reconnect to that natural skill they have. It's like you think about physical pain in the body that's a message for your body going hello <laughs> something not quite right and there's emotional pain no different it's like hello something trapped something didn't get completed we need to complete it and let it go and it's same thing you know it's it's, it's all the same thing but that beautiful intelligence is built into all of us yeah you know it's just we don't listen to it like you said
Lovely. So for people listening then who have said, okay, I have no doubt either um, a story or a limiting belief that's embedded somewhere that's stopping me from moving forward, you know, that I'm driving mm-hmm. with the handbrake on. What, what's normally the first thing that you recommend for them to do to, to, I don't know, go inside or maybe start to release an emotion like that? Right. So the first thing I'll do is I, I teach them how to sit with it and be safe. Okay. Right. Because that's the key point. If they feel safe, they let go. If they don't feel safe, we're deeply, 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 as you know, conditioned to protect ourselves, to stay away from pain. Yeah. Right. Now, we learn this in a physical sense as we're growing up. So we, we bite our own hands. We like stick our fingers in uh, hot things. We trap them indoors. We do whatever. That's just my list. You might have a different one. But, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. but we hurt ourselves, right? And then we know, right, stay away from that pain. Then what we tend to do is as we're developing emotionally, because we've now got a strategy that works, we tend to use it for everything. Yeah. So then we use the same strategy. So when something hurts us emotionally, we move away from it. Yeah. Right. But it turns out if we just stay with it, we complete the feeling level experience of it. And then the energy just flows through us as it's designed to. So the example I use is if you think of like a lion and a gazelle, right? Yeah. So the lion's chasing the gazelle. The gazelle's running for its life. The lion's snapping at its heels. Yeah. And then bit by bit, the lion wears out and the gazelle gets away. About 90 seconds later, it's back grazing, right? It's just, it's physiology is designed to just let the energy through mm. and then it calms down, the heart calms down and it's back eating again. And we're the same. It's just the trouble with us is we've got this newer part of our brain mm. <laughs> that can project things into the future, can projecting, can remember things from the past and can make stories up. Yeah. So we tend to hold things onto things and project them into the future, worry about them. Then we put stuff in the past and carry that around with us. So we're constantly firing off those triggers, yeah. right? So then all we want to do is get away from it. So we learn to numb ourselves down, Yeah. right? So some of us do it with drink, with drugs, with sex, with whatever it is. <laughs> but we'll find somewhere watching TV, anything. You know, we'll just do something to numb ourselves out from that. So what I do is get people back in touch with that system so they can feel things without and understand they're not going to freak out. They're not going to die. Nothing bad's going to happen. Yeah. They just get to feel it. And then what I do is we, I go and trigger things. So for instance, you said there, if you've got something holding you back. So I work a lot with entrepreneurs. So say I've got somebody who, for instance, isn't comfortable charging for their products or whatever. Yeah. So I'll say, right, at what point in the process does this show up? Yeah. So I'm just looking for the trigger, right? So I'll say like, right, so a bit like timeline therapy. So I'll go to them. Get, is it when you produce the invoice? No, I'm all right with the invoice. Okay. So is it when you give them the invoice? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's when I give them the invoice. Right. So just imagine them giving the invoice. Where do you feel that? And they might be like, oh, it's in my throat. And I know stuff in throats usually around expression. It's usually about speaking up for yourself or being heard as a general kind of subject. So then we'll just work on that. So I'll get them to sit with a feeling until it starts to just melt away because you get the right distance away from it. So it's nice and strong, but not too overwhelming. Yeah. And then just sit with it and just let it melt away. Right. And then move in, let it melt away, move in until the feeling's gone. And then I'll say, right, open your eyes then close your eyes. Now go back there again. What's there? And a lot of the time they're like, Oh, nothing. I'm like, okay, so are you all right? Just run it over now. And they'll run it over and they'll go, that's weird. I'm okay. It's all right. I say, right. And then I go on to the, bl- the blueprint, the beliefs meaning the stories. I said, right. What was it you were making that mean? What was it about? Yeah. And once you take the emotion out, right, they usually can see the logic then. Yeah. Because as you know, emotion is not logical. <laughs> so <laughs> when you try and when you try and use your lo- wonderful rational mind on logic, it just goes blah, 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 and scrambles it. And you, yeah. but once you take it out, all of a sudden they'll go, "Oh my god, it, it was that time when my dad said this and blah 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 blah." And I go, "Right, go back to that." Now, how do you feel about that? And they might go, oh, God, that's in my stomach. So stomach's usually around conflict. I was like, "Right, what's the conflict in that?" Oh God, yeah. I kind of believe what he said, but I believe what I say, right? Where do you feel that? And I just kind of go on a journey with them doing that kind of stuff mm. and just taking layers out, layers out, layers out till it gets neutral. Oh. And then I'll say to him, right now, 
think about charging somebody ten thousand pound for a, a minute <laughs> and just really push it yeah and say what's there now and they'll be like oh nothing that yeah, feels good yeah. i just kind of whittle away down through things like that until we get to the bottom and i usually look for something before say before 10 yeah. <laughs> you know anything up to sort of seven eight nine ten or before i'm sort of looking back there because the other stuff usually only occurs because it's resonated with something from way back you know yeah okay and unless they've had a significant trauma later on you know and mm. that can be the cause of it but then they still tend to link back to earlier things anyway so, mm. so that's a general kind of process that i'll go through with somebody but it's largely about getting them to feel safe with themselves yeah okay well wow, that's that's really prime i've got a heap of questions that came up in that <laughs> so so here's an interesting one and and i'd really like to know your answer on this because i'm fairly unsure myself okay so when that's happening obviously that's a biochemical reaction so if we go if we if we start to use logic to explain this it's yeah <laughs> Um, and I, I, by the way, just to reiterate, I, I, I love the way that you just described the way that logic tries to intervene with emotion. And it just, yeah. it's like when I trained as a hypnotherapist and people were coming to see me for phobias, you know, yeah. I, you can never just say, oh yeah, you know that thing? You don't need to be scared of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, don't worry about that. No one ever goes, oh, oh, oh thanks. <laughs> like, you know, you know, you know, where should I send the bill to? You know, it, it, just, it never, never ever works. Um, no. So, so if we look at it on an emotional or on a biochemical level then of well okay in that moment the moment they picture that image which isn't even happening they start to release cortisol and adrenaline and something that starts to build up on a yeah. on a chronic level because i completely agree uh-huh. we have this and you know when we use that same technology in our head to imagine things in the future yeah. well that's how excitement comes about doesn't it so yeah, it's, yeah. i mean i mean it's a wonderful <laughs> bit of kit when used that's well. amazing yeah, but um, yeah, yeah if, if we're in a habit of imagining something going wrong, it's just bloody torture. Yeah. So when we imagine something going wrong, then and suddenly we start to release, you know, the cortisol and the adrenaline mm-hmm. through our body. I totally agree. There, there are certain things that we will do that actually do get rid of that symptom, but it might not be beneficial, like alcohol, like drugs, like yes. food. Yeah. We, um, so many people, you and I guess that's how things become an addiction, isn't it? It's actually what we're looking to do is just yeah. change our biochemistry in that moment we just want to feel good yeah we're <laughs> yeah, so just pleasure monkeys right yeah yeah <laughs> exactly feel good the entire time um so i guess my my question is more based around do do you think we always have to go back i know that's a really really popular method and clearly it works but do we have to go back to that emotion to release it or do you think there's another way that we can change our biochemistry to actually be okay with that situation. Because if that person was charging an invoice, I guess, I guess here's, here's my um, argument for it. If that mm. person was charging or giving that invoice to someone while taking ecstasy, mm. um, which, which, which is a marvelous yeah. image, um, you know, after they give the invoice <laughs> and then wanting to hug them afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> you know, let go of his hand. him with a white glove on and yeah. a whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so if that have, then actually that those disturbances that would come up from that previous moment wouldn't occur, would they? Because the biochemistry no, in the body no. in that moment is so overpowering that actually they have the confidence to deal with it. They have this certainty within themselves, and they have the connection with the person, <laughs> even if that person isn't reciprocating it. <laughs> um, well, I've, I've, I'm living proof of that. Like I said, mm. at weekends, I could play to 2,000 people. And then Monday, I couldn't play to four people. So, mm. yeah, yeah, I, I can't argue with that at all. That's exactly right. So, so do you think, I mean, obviously going back, especially without any, any drugs, is a way that works. Do you think that's the only way? Do you think there's no. another way? Do you think no, we- I'm, ne- I'm never so arrogant to think my way is the only way. Seriously, there's there's many different ways to release that stuff. There's many different ways to approach it. Um, it's just this is the most powerful, quickest, easiest uh, way I've found. Yeah. You know, and that's not to say it is the most powerful, quickest way, but it's the quickest way I've found. Mm-hmm. And it's I think because it was the most powerful way for me too. Yeah. I, my my I'm like hundred percent behind it. You know, and and I've got the sort of evidence of a few hundred people 
sat in front of me having similar experiences. You know, not every single one. They had to play ball because I'm not doing it. It's not <coughs> about me. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not about me. It's uh, their experience and they're driving it, you know. And if they don't want to go somewhere, they don't go. I can't force them to do anything, you know. So, I don't know. I can remember three or four people out of all of those where it didn't work. Yeah. But I could see that their secondary gain was so strong. Uh, you know what I mean by that? So, that they they would have lost to them it appeared they would have lost far more than they would have gained if they'd let go sure. so then they suddenly back out of it and no i don't work it don't work it's not working <laughs> it's like okay yeah. um yeah. but no i'm sure i'm sure there are other ways and um you know i i I'd, i had hypnosis to give up smoking mm. and that worked fantastically well but it also but it didn't work for my trauma stuff you know and um I think it's like I said, it's, we don't just have a hammer. We all have different tools and I use, I don't use a massive amount of NLP, but I use, uh, I use perceptual positions a lot. So I get people to look at things from out different perspectives cause that's so powerful. And I use parts integration a little bit. If people are like on one hand and on the other hand and they've got stuff going on inside, I sometimes use that, but I just use whatever's, feels appropriate at the time i've got no set protocol with anybody i've got no set style or thing i'm going to go i've got no idea what i'm going to do with anybody until they sit down in front of me yeah because i've no idea what they've been through i've no idea how they're going to react to anything i've no idea what's going to come up i've no idea what's how the interaction between us is going to be because that energy between us is everything you know as soon as somebody lets me in it's like oh my god we we just two hours goes like that yeah and then we're the other side of it and it's like wow i feel like i've been on an ayahuasca trip or something it's just been like what the hell uh you know and and they are as well and then it, i always find it interesting like the conversation that you have afterwards yeah because you've just been in this really amazing like uh ultra sensory kind of journey together and then all of a sudden you drop back into Right. Um, <laughs> See you next week. Yeah. <laughs> See you next week. Uh, yeah. Okay. Bye. And uh, it's always interesting because you're suddenly back in the real world yeah. or the unreal world, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. No, and, um, I'm glad you said that just at the end there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so it's interesting, but I don't know. I don't, I've, there are, I know there are lots of other people. I know Joe Dispenza has got a system that he uses that's very much more, uh, Neuro, neurological based yeah. um, and he has incredible results for people so yeah there's more than one way mm. um, there's definitely more than one way it's just this is my way and it works for me so that's what I use yeah. but I'm always open I'm never stuck in my thinking around this kind of stuff you know yeah. some you know what it's like you'll sometimes you'll kind of channel stuff to somebody and you'll go say something and go, God, did I say that? Oh, I'll write that down. <laughs> That's really good. And then use it next time. And then that seems to work with everybody for a while. And it's like, where did that come from? You know, it's amazing. So I'm always flexible in my approach. I always like to uh, look for it being even more powerful for people. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning all the time. I'm always learning. I learn so much from the people I work with. You know, because going through that experience with them, you spot things in you that still resonate with okay. things you're still carrying on. So then you get to release that and then you move forward a little bit. And I love that beautiful dance that you kind of have that, like I said, a partnership Yeah. that you kind of go through that experience with them. And you're both in it. You're both in it. So it's a real win-win. I've got um, I've got a motto in life. I'm going to have it tattooed on me soon because I say it all the time. And that is, if you win, I win. Yeah. And that's how I approach sessions. The only way I went out of this session is if you win. Yeah. And, and I love that partnership going through it together. So, yeah. and the, and the technique I use is so unobtrusive to that partnership. It's not about me. It's not about techniques. It's not about anything. It's just about keeping them in touch with their feelings and then guiding them through what they're feeling. Yeah which is so simple and elegant and powerful because it's all inside them, not me. It's not me doing it, you know? And as soon as I learned to get out of my own way and to think and my ego thinking, Oh, I'm really good at this and blah, 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 and just get to the point where like, 
reel it in. <laughs> You're not doing it. They're doing it, and that's fine. And as soon as I did that, everything worked loads better. You know, and that was probably about three years ago. I suddenly at a retreat I was working on, stuff was coming out of my mouth, and I'm like, I have never said stuff like this before. This is not me. You know what I mean? And then I was like, ah, I just get to sit here and be a conduit kind of thing for whatever is earth is happening here. Yeah. And then that's how I kind of approach it now. So at first, like we all are, you're a little bit nervous about, you know, what's someone going to show up with? What if you don't know what to do? What if you don't know what to say? Now I know I'm not really doing it. <laughs> so it's, there's no pressure. It's like this. I knew we'd have a, an awesome time having a chat, you know, even though we're not really met, we just had a few text messages and yeah. I don't think about stuff like that anymore. Cause I know it'd be perfect in the moment and it just flows through, you know, yeah, that's, so that's a really that was a really long answer to a no, short question. No, very well though, Tim. I loved it. <laughs> in in a weird, it's it, it just got me thinking when you said that the idea of, of when I mentioned about the phobia of saying, "Oh, you don't need to worry about that thing," and then they stop. In a weird way, though, it's almost like it's contradicted though because just what you said there, it's almost like just being in your presence, you've allowed them to give themselves the permission to do it. Yeah. In a weird yeah. way, it's it's almost like you said. By the way, you've had the key the whole time, but just I'm just yeah, yeah. on the table. Go go nuts, you know. Exactly. Well, my friend won't mind me telling you this. Um, he had a phobia of flying, right? And he had like the worst phobia of flying I've ever seen. Like three weeks before, he starts getting interrupted sleep and starts worrying about it. His wife's a travel agent, by the way, so <laughs> they're always on holiday, and um, and by the time he gets to the week before, he's not sleeping. The night before he can't sleep, he can't drive to the airport because he's that scared of it. Yeah. And he just somehow gets himself on the plane, which might involve a few drinks. I can't remember if he said or not. Maybe I made that up. But anyway, he gets himself on the plane somehow. And then he's just like in terror for the whole flight and then gets to the other end. He's all right for a few days and then starts worrying about coming back. And he said, I'm just spoiling the holidays. And so anyway, he's never done anything like this, never done a thing, anything like this at all. So I was like, right. So walk me through it, right? What, when does it start to happen? So he's like, it really gets bad when I get to the airport. So I was like, right, close your eyes, imagine that. So I said, where do you feel that? It goes in my chest. And I said, right, so just go and feel it. And then he went, is this weird? <laughs> I love it when people ask that question. Yes, yeah. <laughs> It's like, awesome, it's working. I was like, what is what weird? He goes, I've got like a green ball of light in front of me. <laughs> and I went, perfect. I yeah. said, just focus on the green light right, and let me know when it starts to change color. So he's like, okay. So he sat there for a bit and he goes, it's going white. I went, cool. Let me know when it's white. So after a bit, he's like, yeah, it's white. And I went, cool. Right. Open your eyes. And I said, right. Tell me about going to fly now. And he went, it's all right. <laughs> And I was like, wow, okay. Um, did you get any kind of insight while you were in there? And this blew my mind. This was the first time. I don't even know why, why I asked him this. This was really early on when I'd only just started. Okay. I was doing the free ones for my friends to get experience. Yeah. And I don't know why I even asked him, but I just asked him, did you get any insight while you were in there? And he went, yeah. I went, what's that? And he goes, it's not about flying. I said, right, what, what was it? And he said, we were coming back from India and they go, they go on holidays of big family. And he said, um, I was coming back and my nana, my, we hit some turbulence and my nana, my auntie was screaming and I was sat there in hysterics laughing at them. And then I fell asleep and had a dream that the plane crashed. And then it was, and then it was the feeling of guilt for laughing at them after the plane had crashed. Wow. That's what it was. That's what it was underneath it all. So like took that out and then he was on holiday the week after. So I forgot about it. And then I went to work and he wasn't there. So I was like, Oh, he must be in. So I sent him a message and said, um, how are you getting on? Uh, how was the flight? And he sent me a message back going, shit, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> and, it and it was like, but, it, but I love it. Cause when you take, like I said, when you take the emotion out, all of a sudden you can see the logic then. Yeah. And that's what he had seen. And that's what started me to develop that part of it was the experience with him up until then I'd just done energy stuff 
yeah but just on the emotion stuff but it's when you take that out and see what's underneath those stories that are you're running underneath are everything yeah. you know because i call it the blueprint because we tend to play our life out in accordance yeah. with those uh rules so like my big one was people don't believe me because of what happened when i was seven yeah. so guess what i used to lie all the time so people didn't believe me to prove my story right <laughs> and i called it exaggeration but mm. it's really lying you know <laughs> Oh, but wow. it's uh it's fascinating when you start picking those stories apart and seeing i love i love what bruce lipton uh says about um he said if you want the hard copy of of your belief systems look at your life yeah and i and yeah. and that's perfect so that's what i do with people where are you stuck you know how would you like it to be where are you what's in the way those kind of questions and then just chip away at the stuff that's in the way you know no, I do love a bit of Bruce Lipton. No, I completely forgot about like that. That's a that's a, that's a corker. Oh, no. yeah, it's me. I love that one. I really? love that one. Have, have you ever heard of the human givens approach? Yeah, I have. I've not. I don't know anything about it, but I've heard of it. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a few things that you've mentioned there, and it and it's and, and they believe in it, and a lot of the stuff they've done seems to have proven this. But obviously, at the moment, we don't have the technology to prove it. But they yeah. say that the idea of REM sleep. So the rapid eye movement state when we essentially were dreaming. Um, they say that's essentially the time where all the emotional memories that we have, it's mm. the job of the REM process amongst other things to move that memory from an emotional one to a narrative one, one that we have control over. So essentially right. we can sew together the templates of what happened from that memory. And then slowly we move it into the logical center or more sort of the the, the logical memory center even to so the parietal lobe they say that in that moment we've been able to take what we needed from that memory we've learned from it and then yeah. when we wake up the next day we feel much better which is why it's always let's sleep on it which is why sometimes something happens yesterday it wasn't too great but we've completely forgotten about that because rem did the job and we might have replayed what happened that day or we might have done it where there were animals and something it was this weird metaphor like a yeah yeah point. But the theory behind it is that, well, actually, the moment that we've, we're having that REM, the whole process is moving the emotional memory into a narrative one. Right. And, and, that, and when I first heard that, I thought it was quite interesting because, obviously, mm. we know that sleep's vital for any kind of health. Yeah, yeah. But have you come across Jordan Peterson's self-authoring program? No, no. Are you familiar with Jordan Peterson, the, the psychologist? No. Okay, so, no. he, he, again, he, he essentially talked about it was almost like journaling but it was a journaling process that mimics what the human givens were saying about REM. So his okay. theory was the emotional trauma that we've got, and you described it perfectly with the, um, the gazelle running away from the lion. Well, actually, the loop finished. It went back to the present moment. It took what it needed from that, and it hasn't needed to replay it again. So stress is over. Yeah. And Jordan Peterson says that actually, if we still have feelings from whatever happened before, the idea of it, similar to your friend on the plane, it's, I didn't take what I needed from that. I didn't take the meaning that was mm. needed. I didn't learn from that experience properly. I didn't close the, finish the loop. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's still a problem. So he uses more of like um, a journaling process where there's a few different mm. questions going back to that memory, describing it as it happened. And the action of writing it down is almost like that REM process of taking the emotional memory and making it into a narrative one. So it sounds very, very similar to the kind of stuff that you're talking about, except See, the way I, the way I explain it fits in with that really well, actually, because yeah. I looked for, I love simplicity, right? Mm. So, so when somebody sat in front of me, the last thing I want to do is start talking about brains and all that kind of stuff. So I looked for the simplest way I could explain this. And over the years I evolved the splinter because mm. And I think also with emotional things, because you can't see it and because it's a bit taboo to talk about emotional problems and mental health and that kind of stuff, I've just picked something as a simple metaphor that everybody can understand. So I picked a splinter. So if you think of a splinter, right, a wooden splinter, you've got a big piece of wood comes along, hits you, small piece of it breaks off and goes inside, right? And it hurts. Yeah. But after a while, it hurts. So we stay away from it and we protect protect keep it away from people whatever and eventually it'll heal over and we'll sort of be okay it feels okay but then when someone comes and grabs us right on it yeah. it's still in there and it'll dig in and you jump right you react to it now emotional splinters no different right so we've got this kind of level that we can deal with 
anything up to this level is kind of normal and will flow out from us like the lion and gazelle, right? Mm. But anything goes over the top here is called trauma. And right. I define trauma as a simple thing, right? Trauma is just more than you can deal with in that moment, okay. right? So it's something that goes over that limit. When it goes over that limit, that has to go somewhere. And that's like the splinter. It goes in. We take it inside the energy of it. We take it inside. When we take it in, it encodes the feelings, the sounds, the sights, the smells, everything that's going on in that moment, the emotions you're feeling, go in with it, right? But then guess what? This feels bad, so we keep away from it, and we keep all the people away from it, and eventually it kind of heals over until someone comes and presses us on it, and it triggers it. Yeah. And when it triggers it, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the, everything comes back. But then what we tend to do is put groups of these similar ones all together and the buildup of these are things like anxiety, depression, because they're kind of really sore spots that we're staying away from. Yeah. But also because we didn't learn what we needed to learn from them. So I agree with that, right? There's something about that that our body won't let go of it until it understands it. And this is what I do. Get people to sit with it and just allow yourself to experience it again because that experience, the feeling level of it just allows it to complete. And then when your body realizes, okay, I've got everything I need from it, it lets it go. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, what I'm going to teach you today is how to take out emotional splinters. And people just get that straight away because, and the thing is, right, we don't have one of these. We've got thousands of the things. So every single one of them, we try to stay away from. So how can you be yourself if you're not able to be in every part of yourself? Yeah. So it's like, if you've got like your arm broken or something and it's really sore, you're not going to go and shake someone's hand with your left hand. No. You know, you're not going to put your left hand up and wave. You're not going to do, there's lots of stuff that will stop you being you. And it's the same emotionally. And then you wonder why people get lost, why they don't feel like themselves, why they feel like imposters, why they, you know, that all of these things make sense when you start looking at it on that kind of level or yeah. it does to me. So I, like I said, I just keep it simple, but I agree with that. I agree with that totally. You need to learn whatever you needed to learn from that part in order to let it go. You know, and sometimes people get stuff and they won't be able to let it go. So then I'll say to them, because I believe that every part of us has consciousness, right? So I'll say, where, where, where's your feeling it on the beam of chest? I'll go, just go to that point in your chest and just ask it, what do you get to learn in order to let it go? Yeah. And like people come out with crazy stuff. They'll be like, okay, yeah, that I need to start <laughs> looking after myself. Yeah, perfect. And how do you start looking after yourself? I need to start eating properly. I need to start sleeping. I need to start. Perfect. So just tell it, can you make a deal with it? Are you going to do that? And they'll be like, yeah, okay. I'll say, well, tell it then. Tell it you're going to do that. And now say, is there anything it needs to know? And they'll go, no. I'll say, right, let it go then. And then they'll go, oh, it's gone. You know, and it, I have a crazy conversation with people, but it works because it's only them resolving their own stuff inside themselves. Yeah. And it shows up in all kinds of amazing ways. And it invent, it's the, that's why I love the process because you never know. Mm. You know, some people are visual, some people are kinesthetic, some people are auditory, and you'll get a version of the journey that's maybe hugely visual. You might get one that's all about feelings you know, and the, and I love that variety and the flexibility to do that with people, you know. Wow. I'll tell you, you were the king of clubs to me, the king of metaphors. Now I'm loving these. <laughs> <That's, laughs> I'm like, going to say, a business partner's in the room, I'm angry that he doesn't have a journal writing this down. This is crap. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been, I'm thinking, okay, it's been, I've got to take that. That's, that's <laughs> a really gem there. Okay, so let, let, let's, let's talk about ayahuasca for a little bit then. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I, I personally haven't done it. I've had a, a shamanic practitioner on it a couple of weeks ago. Um, oh. And I've spoken to a few people who have done it and a few different healers as well. And it, it sounds extraordinary. Um, but the question that I asked her, and I'd, I'd love to ask you the same question, is we know that when we take a substance and our biochemistry changes, um, you know, if you take MDMA, if we take mushrooms, if we, whatever they call even alcohol, there's a biochemical shift. But we don't necessarily have in enlightening experience from that we'll know that we feel amazing but to attach that to the spiritual mm. that's not normally a gap that most people will suddenly jump into whereas i personally and, and neither had the shamanic practitioner no one's come across um someone yet who has taken ayahuasca and said oh yeah my brain was on some serious drugs there it's always 
no, yeah. my brain, no, not my brain, I, that my yeah. embodiment, yeah. whatever I was, my expression of the universe, however you want to put it, and um, tuned into something. And what I actually saw or what I actually was or what I actually felt was real. So no, I did actually die and I did choose to come back as opposed to that was just an experience that my brain had. Um, but what about yourself? Would you, would you fall into the category of, know that I actually saw that or do you think it was just the body going under some serious biochemical changes? Uh, no, I'll be the same as everyone else. I yeah. absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely, and like, I've got a lot of experience of the other, yeah. you know, um, a lot of experience, especially in hallucinogenics, LSD and mushrooms. I've taken massive amounts of both and it has that quality to it in some ways. Yeah. Uh, but there's definitely something different. There's definitely, I wouldn't have said I was spiritual before I went. Mm. Um, that wasn't a word I ever used about myself. Mm. Um, and I came back firmly spiritual. I, I've always felt disconnected from the world. Okay. I've always felt like I was on my own. And I hear all the stuff about we're all one, we're all connected, blah, blah, blah. And I like the romantic vision of that. And I like, the idea of it and I felt like that on MDMA and stuff like that but in life I didn't feel like that right S since ayahuasca I do feel like that and because she showed me uh I'm sure everyone's told you about you go and meet Aya yeah, uh, yeah. Mother, Mother Mother Aya Oscar. Yeah. yeah yeah so Aya showed me that and it, it was interesting because the shaman um we did it in Bogota in Colombia mm -hmm. and the shaman's like number of generations shaman like real deal kind of indigenous people and that she's um she said what's your intention for the first journey so mm. i was like i said i always feel like i'm disconnected and it's like uh even if i'm with somebody i'm really close to like my missus or something i feel like there's like a sheet of polythene between us that means we can't quite touch we can't quite really connect yeah. there's a disconnect and um she said, okay, so ask I when you get in there, what, what is it? So I was like, okay. So I uh, got in there and the first bit of the experience was like super trippy, like looking really, really trippy, like mm -hmm. sacred geometry and kaleidoscopic vision and all the stuff people tell you about. Yeah. And, um, and then all of a sudden it all calmed down and then it was like, right, I'll get to ask. So I was like, what's stopping me? Um, what's stopping me doing this? So she turned my head towards my mate who sat across the grass and went, would you? And I went, no, I'm not into guys. <laughs> right. So she went, oh, rules. I went, right. And then she turned my head again. And then there was my friend Joe there as a girl. And she went, would you? And I went, no, I'm in a relationship. Oh, more rules. And then she just kept challenging my rules, challenging my rules. And it got to the point it was getting louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And I ended up flipping on my front and I hit the floor and went, fuck off, it's my rules. Uh. <laughs> and, then, and then I flipped back on my back and I found myself patting myself on the chest going, yeah, they're your rules. And it was me taking my power back a little bit. And I was like, and then she was like, right, is this your rule? And it was like Tinder, yes and no. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> what a it was like, hello. It was like, is this your rule? No. Is this your rule? No. 95% of all the stuff was stuff I'd been told by parents growing up, teachers, other yeah. kids, blah, blah, blah. But I'd been carrying it around like it was mine. Yeah. So I never knew how to, I never knew what to be because I got all these stupid rules. So I got rid of 95% of them and the ones I kept, she went, right, they now, not just rules, which one of those are boundaries? And I'm like, oh, I don't know the difference. So then she gave me a like vision of what boundaries are opposed to rules mm -hmm. and it was like just the deepest learning and this took about five minutes <laughs> it took me longer to explain it than because everything goes at ultra speed in your head and it's like yeah. and then i was like Phew, okay and then she's like get it and like i'm like you can see people sat around on the grass just nodding because they've just got something <laughs> you know and i'm like she's like get it and i'm like got it got it okay okay she goes right next and then it was just lessons like that after lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson yeah and then and then after the lessons finished i was sat there and she was like i went i don't i still don't feel connected she went take your blanket away because i was sat on a blanket on the grass yeah. 
So I took the blanket away and I put my hands on the grass and she went, feel the grass. And I looked at my hands and I was like, oh, God, the grass is an organism like me. And then I'm like, oh God, it's got consciousness. And I felt the grass's consciousness. I know it sounds weird, but, and then I was holding onto the tree and like my mates were all laughing at me. because I was just hanging onto things and smiling and like, but what <laughs> I was going, I was seeing myself as part of everything and connected to everything. Mm. And it was very much like the matrix when he wakes up in the thing and the pipes pop off and that yeah. it was very much like that. Very much like I'm part of this big matrix kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, that changed everything yeah. just that experience alone but then you bloody right it would yeah <laughs> god and then she showed me my love my uh, beauty my power and got me to feel them yeah and it's just like overwhelming man it was like i was like just cry sobbing with joy <laughs> you know it was like crazy and then at the end she got me to go back and clear up my childhood because that stuff that happened around seven yeah. was so protected in me that I couldn't even remember it. The only reason I know it existed is when my mum would die and she told me the whole story and said, sorry. So she obviously knew that it had not been a good time, but it was never spoken about, never kind of addressed Well, we were well in conscious land, but then she told me that. So then I got to go back and release the sadness, release the anger against them, the hatred against them for not sticking up for me all of that stuff I got to let go of all of that and I came back like a different person really different person I thought I was cleared up until I went there and that was totally totally different and yeah I really felt like I'd been somewhere that I can't I've got no words to explain it yeah. but it made me feel part of humanity yeah so whether it was just a biochemical change in my body or I actually went somewhere, I don't, I can't give you a, no. an objective view of that, you know, but whatever it is, and I'm around a lot of people who've done it now and we do it every couple of months now. Yeah. Um, half for fun and half for just going and next, getting yourself next level. Yeah. Um, and all the people I'm around who do that have got no problems. They've got all this stuff cleared up. They're, they've, they let go of addictions. They let go of unwanted behaviors. They let go of hatred. They let go of negativity. They let go of all kinds of good stuff and have a really, really healthy outlook on life, you know? Yeah. So I can't answer it because I don't know because you're in it, aren't you? So it's very difficult to know, but it does feel different to like acid or um, mushrooms. It's got a little bit of that, but there's also a, um, I can remember me and my mate once did some acid and we'd like, we were putting the worlds to rights and I can remember turning around to him and going, I've got it. I've got it. And he went, what have you got? I went life. I get it. I've got it. I've got it. And then we woke up in the morning and he goes, what was that about life? I went, Oh, I don't know. I haven't got it. I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, because you, there's always that aspect to, I found to mushrooms and that it's, mm. you might be in the moment understanding what the hell's going on, but then you don't bring it back with you. Whereas ayahuasca, I always bring the lessons back and they always make sense. And they've always shifted something really deep in me, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's the experience that my missus is totally different though. She doesn't get trippy. She don't get trippy at all, right? She just has a really deep feeling experience yeah. and resolves things in her own way like that. You know, she'll get little lessons and stuff, but she doesn't do all the trippy bit at all, which wow. is really crazy because I've not met anyone else and neither of the shaman met anyone else who doesn't do it, but she doesn't. She's just completely straight all the way through it. But it just goes through it, takes it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. And, 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 laugh, and laughs at me being an absolute off my tits idiot because <laughs> I'm the other end of the scale. I'm like, I think because I'm used to being that off my tits, I don't feel, I feel safe being that out of control. So yeah. I just let it go. I just let go because I enjoy it. It's, it's good fun. It's, yeah. it's a bit well, scary at times, but it's, you are facing, um, there's no hiding when you're in there. There's yeah. no like, Oh no, I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> You know, so if you do do it or when you do it, 
I was given this advice by the shaman's best friend in in Bogota because he could speak English. He couldn't speak English, so he was translating and he took us out for a meal and he said, I've got one bit of advice for you. I said, what's that? And he's done 120 odd journeys. Um, it's their kind of culture. They do it all the time. So he's like, whatever comes up, face it. Yeah. And he said, you won't want to. He said, I'm telling you now, there's bits you won't want to face, but face it. He said, her, Aya's goal is to get you to die while you're alive. Because if you die, it's death of the ego, they call it. Right. And he said, if you, if you can die while you're in there, you come back enlightened. And I've been so close at times and now I can't do it. I can't face it. It's too scary. It's, and um, I've had that happen twice recently. And um, the shaman went, did she try and take you? I went, yeah. And I was like, I could, I could not. It, I can't even explain the terror. It was like, but he said, you're getting really advanced if you're kind of getting towards. The, the near-death experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's, apparently that, that's almost the, the last part before it's like, okay, you, you actually have the, um, <laughs> you have the nurse to be able to say you're, you're a shamanic practitioner. It's when you've gone, it's yeah. when you've died and, and, and faced it and come back. Yeah, and and it's weird. It's, it's not the first time I've heard that where someone has just said, you know, I could die and I could come back, or or said, okay, it's asking me if I want to die, and I, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not ready to have this conversation yeah, yeah. anymore. Almost. That's yeah, it shows. It shows up for me as this. There's no question or anything, but it just shows up as a. I just I I've just. It's really hard to put into words. I've kind of lost any comprehension of what reality is mm. and i'm like i'm convinced that we are all one i'm convinced that we're all connected so deeply that they know what i'm thinking and i do things like go look around if you know what i'm thinking in my head <laughs> nobody's looking around and i'm like shit that doesn't work <laughs> but, but that's what it feels like it feels like we're so one that mm. they're just going to know everything that's about me you know and it's at that point when i start getting a bit freaked and then and i told him that and he goes yeah that's the point that's the point when you let go of reality because he said that's what's holding every all of us back he said is that is the reality we've been trained into not mm. human reality but the modern human reality yeah. you know society and all that kind of stuff yeah. he said once you get outside of that everything looks so different mm. So it's just letting go of that kind of thing. But it's a, it's an amazing experience. It really is. You know, and 90% of it is really good. It's just you do face stuff, you know. Um, and that's what I, mean, I was always told, you know, this is, not, this is not something that you just do with your mates on a Friday night. This is, no, do you, no, do you no. want to get real and heavy right now? Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Graham Hancock explained it the best when he said it's, it's to be taken seriously. It's to be taken like yes. not taken lightly. Yeah. You know, and that's not to say it's dangerous or horrible or anything. It's just, it is a serious thing. It's not, it's not going to get off your head. If you want to do that, have MDMA. It's much more fun. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful state to get in. And I, I know quite a few people who've done DMT as well. And apparently that's even crazier because you're, out of it for 20 minutes like completely you're on a different planet yeah and and what's fascinating is because I've, I've watched a few programs on this yeah. saying is it just biochemistry or is it are you going somewhere and the thing that's weird is everybody sees the same stuff and this is people even when they don't know what they're supposed to see so you know even people who have had no exposure to it whatsoever and don't know what they're taking it's not they know what they're taking. These are clinical studies they've done with people who don't even know what they're taking. So it's not like they've been told you might see blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Everyone sees the same kind of animals. Everyone sees the same kind of skate, uh, cityscapes, the same kind of, they all see the same shit. So that's either, so then I go down the kind of path in my head trying to logically explain that. Yeah. Is it something encoded into us as a human that those kind of chemicals just happen to bring out or, yeah. or are we going somewhere? I don't know who knows i don't know but it it's weird that everybody has a very very similar experience you know that's wow it, that, that that's really 
because in my mind, I guess that that was a theory, and I, I know it's it's just a theory. And to be honest, if and when I do end up having someone like myself, I'll probably look back on this conversation and just <laughs> how dare you make a make a statement <laughs> about it without having even gone down down that road? Because you know, if you look at people like I don't know Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins, or actually let's look specifically at Sam Harris, someone who likes the idea of using the word spiritual without any religious ties to yeah, it. Same it. Religious. Yeah, same Yeah, because it doesn't have to be. But he also removes any mysticism from it, mm. and and that, that's quite nice. And obviously, logically, that I I really like what he talks about, and he says you know you can have all these experiences, and we know that the only thing that isn't an illusion is consciousness itself that's the only thing that cannot be an illusion um but he says that it doesn't matter what experiences that you have they're all being presented to the same consciousness but he's had acid and he's had those experiences he's had mdma he's had those experiences but he hasn't had ayahuasca mm. so it would be interesting to hear someone like him take mm. take a i don't know some sort of medicinal um drug like that to be yeah. able to, to actually, whether he comes out there and goes, oh no, I, there's there's definitely something outside of the the, the body that's that's entangled in all this. And um, but what you're saying about us being one, I've I've, I've had experiences like that during meditation myself, mm. but I can't imagine it being anywhere near as <laughs> as, as as strong as what what you're describing. Um, but I guess the yeah, I guess that's the theory. Could it just be that? I also switches a few biochemical shifts that makes us, I don't know, tap into that trauma because essentially it, it's, it sounds like a, a hundredfold version of what you're doing with people where you're just taking the blocks out. Well, I was good. Exactly. That's exactly how I explain it to people. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. I haven't got an answer for that because it's like I said, it's so subjective because I'm in it, you yeah. know, and, and who knows? I don't know, but what I do know is there's, I love science, right? And, but science is just a description of reality. Mm. It's not reality. Yeah. So I, so I find it very difficult when all the science people start wanting peer reviewed studies of everything before it can even exist in the world. Yeah. You know, it is a study of reality and it can't explain things people still cannot explain the double slit experiment in quantum physics. Yeah. The observer effect, you know, the, the collapse of the function, nobody can explain uh, the collapse of the waveform. Yeah. Nobody can explain that. Right. So no, it's not a scientist in the world can explain how that works. Yeah. So then science doesn't know everything. Right. Mm. So I don't, so I don't know. I'm not saying one way or the other, but I'm just saying it annoys me when people get on that whole tip of, cause to me, that's just judgment. It's judgment the same as anything else. And it's, it's interesting. So I'm like really, you know, Wim Hof. Yeah. I, I trained with him in Poland. Oh, did, oh, of course you did. Of course you did. <laughs> so I spotted somebody, I was learning the breathing technique on a YouTube video and then all the science crew got on the bottom of them and saying, this is a load of bullshit. All it is, is like, blah, blah, blah. Haven't you done your simple science? Blah, blah, blah. This is, and, uh, and I was like, do you know that this guy has been studied beyond belief by science? <laughs> Because they wouldn't, you know, because of all the stuff he did with the poisons and not getting sick and yeah. and the stuff he does is not possible for a human, <laughs> you know, according well, to supposedly. Yeah, the, oh, I, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. And and it's nice when he says, well, actually, what I'm doing, everyone can do. I'm not some yeah, yeah. An anomaly. I'm not some sort of outlier in the experiments. But um, but I think I think. I think science can be like the modern religion at times. It can be. You know, I, I, I get pure science yeah. is the same as pure spirituality, yeah. right? There's no dogma. There's no kind of fixed thing in it. It's just a way of thinking. And, I, and, and it's a fantastic thing, and it's brought us amazing things in the world. But it's also misused a lot these days, you yes. know, especially when it comes to food and drugs and blah, 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 blah. It's used massively wrong, <laughs> You know, and it's used for, for power and it's misused for power. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you even study that stuff. <laughs> so I, I don't know how you could prove it or disprove it. Yeah. I, I really don't know. All, all I know is to me, it feels real. Mm. And, 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 and things happened that, you know, I know, I know that 
science or say coincidence and blah, blah, blah. But there was things like I was laid there and I was just coming out of an experience and we're in the, they have like a round shed thing called a Maloco and I was like laid on my side and I could see Maria, who's the shaman's daughter. I saw her going to bend down to somebody and talk to them. And I just laid there and closed my eyes and I was like, oh God, I write on an incense stick. But I can't be asked to even open my mouth. I'm just like so mashed. So I just laid there. And then about two minutes later, I sent somebody at the side of me. So I opened my eyes and it was Maria bending down, putting an incense stick in a little thing next to me. And she put my hand on my head and went, is that the one you wanted? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, and I'm like, did I speak? I didn't. And then afterwards I went, did I speak to you? She went, no, no, no. I just felt you wanted that. And I was like, shit. And there was loads of stuff like that happening, you know? Mm. And I don't know, maybe it's coincidence. Maybe it's not. It's, I don't know. I really don't know. I've got no explanation for it myself, Yeah. Uh, but I know it happened, you know? And, and I think there's so much stuff that we know happens as humans, but nowadays it seems you have to have a peer reviewed study before anyone will take anything seriously, Yeah. you know, and, and there is a place for that stuff. And I understand that, you know, and I'm not dissing it at all. It's just, that isn't the only way that's one viewpoint, you know, and there's also the viewpoint I've got as that, um, I've seen hundreds of people get better. Yeah. So I know what I do works. I am going to, I can't tell you the science. It's a splinter for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's an emotional splinter. It's, yeah. I, I don't know what it is. I can, I'm sure there's a scientific explanation for it, but I don't know, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work, you yeah. know? And the same with ayahuasca, maybe there's a, an explanation for it, what it does, but I don't care. It works. Yeah. It works. Yeah. And it's, and it's, um, it's a personal choice whether you want to do it or not, but it's, fantastic um and i know it's it's not always nice but you know doing work on yourself isn't always nice no no it's there was a metaphor that i heard where it might have been jay shetty who talked about the idea of when you're trying to clean a mirror that hasn't been cleaned for a while to see yourself where it's gonna get dusty so when you start cleaning (laughs) all the dust off you might get some dust in your throat and it's not a nice yeah yeah when you get to see yourself for the first time afterwards it can be beautiful so i yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah god it's it's it is such a, a fascinating topic i guess the and, and i agreed with pretty much every single thing that you said there and we even know that even the peer-reviewed studies about 50 percent of them aren't accurate anyway uh, when it comes to bias or trying to measure one variable when there's a million going on yeah, yeah. and you know, there's a big movement that's happening at the moment that i'm that i'm a part of but i i, I think it's easy to go too far with it and that's the the biohacking movement Right. Are you familiar with, with biohacking or biohackers? Heard of it, yeah, yeah. So it's the idea of, of, I didn't really know it existed until a couple of years ago when I thought, oh, I think that's kind of similar to what I'm doing, which is people working on what's going on with themselves biochemically and how can we hack that to mm. essentially mm. optimize our performance mentally and physically. Um, and the, a little bit like science and spirituality in its purest form, beautiful, mm. but we can take that too far where actually we start trying to think our way to feeling better or we yeah. or we're quantifying one variable and taking actions on that one variable without taking into consideration everything else so yeah. so we, we we can have certain devices that will release certain you know emf waves that can help optimize our brain but we mm. know that if we just walk in nature for an hour we'll, we'll get the same benefits <laughs> with with other things on top of that or um, exactly you know, we, we can get all the right pulsing electric, you know, vibration mm. plates that can trigger off certain things to help with bone density and, you know, I don't know, increasing muscle size or, you know, we can just... For a rub. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's it. So I, I certainly lean towards the ancestral health, I guess, is the next step in my journey. I'm obviously very fascinated with the ayahuasca experience because actually, is, is there something else we, we don't know? But I guess when it comes to someone's health and happiness... To some extent, maybe the other question that should be asked is, who cares? Mm. As, as, as long as it's working, I guess, I guess the reason I'm really fascinated to find out what is actually going on is because when we do know what is actually going on, that's when we can use it safer or use it more effectively, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then that might come with a whole host of other bits of knowledge and little nuggets that come with it as to how we can we can all become you know happier, healthier people. Um, but in the interim, yeah, it seems to be doing its job. And and this conversation has certainly just, <laughs> just made my curiosity for it just become exponential, Tim. So thanks. thanks You're welcome. And um, so for any people who are listening to this, obviously, we're going to talk about the fact that we mentioned trauma and obviously the, mm. um, the fact that you're a specialist in the subject. If you could give them just one tip, if there was one takeaway from the conversation, or one takeaway from your expertise, what would it be? Good question. It's just to, in whatever way you do it, whether it's the work I do, whether it's meditation, whether it's mindfulness, whatever it is, learn to get back inside. Yeah. Because that is truly where all the answers are. And it's not always the nicest place to go and it's not always the easiest place to get to and it's not always the quietest place or the friendliest place, but it's where the answers are. You know, there's a, there's a Sufi parable that I love uh, that I used to start some of my talks off with and um, this guy's outside his house and he's like scrambling around on the floor looking for his keys. So his neighbor walks along and went, what, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I've lost my keys. He said, oh, would you like a hand? He goes, yeah, yeah. So they're both scrambling around for about another five minutes. And then his neighbor says to him, are you sure you dropped the keys out here? And he went, no, I dropped them inside. But there's a light out here. (laughs) And I kind of think that's where we are as a race. We've kind of had the light shining where the answers aren't for so long. Mm. Because we've had the light shining outside, right? The light needs shining inside. (laughs) Because all the answers are there. So it's whatever you do, whether it's, I don't know, if you want to do tapping, if you want to do uh, meditation, if you want to, whatever you want to do, but just get yourself inside somehow. Because that's, I spent a good 12, 13 years working on the outside, yeah. doing Tony Robbins, doing NLP, doing all that kind of stuff. Not that they're not inside, but they tend not to be so quiet inside. Yeah. And, and then the one weekend I went and learned this stuff, everything changed. Mm. And that was just by going and being, learning how to resolve stuff within me. Yeah. Because then when you get connected back to you and you start mending that relationship with yourself, then things, the whole world's different. Mm. You know, it, I was talking to somebody yesterday and um, I said to them, I can't believe how beautiful my life is now. I just can't believe how happy I am. I didn't think that was possible. And I was told it wasn't possible. So I'm making a series of videos at the moment, minute called I am possibility just to show people what's possible. Cause until you know, it's possible, you don't even look for the answers, mm. but I want to be a shining light to people that I, it is possible, right? I could not have been in a darker place 10 years ago. Yeah. I was in a horrible, horrible place scared of everything, anxious about everything, depressed about everything, often freaking out about things, having panic attacks and all kinds of stuff. I couldn't go in a pub. I couldn't go anywhere on my own where there was crowds of people. Now none of that exists. It's all gone. And I don't have to do anything. I don't do any work on myself anymore. It's just gone. And that's possible. And the reason that's possible is because I learned to go inside. So the only advice I'd give is go inside and you're more than welcome. We do, we're going to start doing webinars every couple of weeks and uh, they're not hugely salesy. They're more giving you an experience of how we take people inside and people are more than welcome to come along to those and get an experience of what it feels like to release an emotion and that kind of stuff. Uh, Cause it's a bit of a weird thing to feel the first time you do it. Of course. Um, and then if somebody can take that for free and go and clear themselves up, then I'm a, I'm a happy camper as well. You know, it's, I'm not about, it's not about making tons of money off everything. You know, we like to share our work with people anyway. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's my advice. Beautiful. And obviously people who are interested in that, Tim, whereabouts can they find you at the moment? Um, <clears throat> so this will have the wrong page if you go to it right at the moment, but, uh, I'll change that very quickly. So it's um, it's www.express 
dash your dash self dot co dot uk yeah okay and i'll be amazed if anyone can just listen to that and not hear the song as uh, as you said that <laughs> by the way that is my theme tune every <laughs> time i say it, it's in my head it's <laughs> fantastic and is 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 there any way that else they can contact you or where they find everything they need on there when it's when well you it... could it, come and uh, come and find us on facebook um yeah. so again if you just search for the if you go into facebook and search for express yourself family yeah that's our facebook group and everyone's welcome on there um it's very very nice loving supportive community where people just share their journeys with each other and uh we give people advice and stuff and yeah again it's not sales or anything it's just a little community um and i post loads of videos on there so and tracy my business partner she does as well so everyone's more than welcome on there too fantastic well thanks ever so much for coming on the show tim it's it's been such a blast i've had a ball <laughs> and, thank and, you man no please do come on again at some point it's been great i'd love to i'd love to yeah just ask me man and i'm there Happy, happy days. You take care and have a good one. You too, my friend. See you later.